there's absolutely no point in reinventing the wheel. Instead, the important thing is to ensure that you follow the customs and established practices. So what topics or slides are typically found in a pitch deck? Well, um, just like Kaya, I would divide it into three sections. The intro section consisting of a cover slide, the problem description, the solution, and sometimes a product demo. Then the section on why we will make you rich, uh, which contains typically the market size, business model, competition, underlaying magic, and go to market plan and team. And then the wrap up containing the traction and milestones achieved, uh, and the fundraising information. So what should actually be on your pitch deck? Well, um, slide beans have produced this overview where they have been looking at what several different uh, venture capitalists and famous accelerators and angel investors uh, would like to see on their pitch decks that are sent to them. So uh, what you can see that all of these have in common is the problem, the solution or value proposition, the business model, the competition, the funding team, and the fundraising information. And then some of them also want to see additional information. Now with this, I want to stress that you have to modify your pitch deck depending on whom you send it to. And you should follow what the investors would like to see. Now, if this is what uh, different investors want, let's have a look at what has actually been included in the pitch decks of seven uh, quite famous companies, including also one more recent company monthly. Now, I would like to ask you a, a question here, because on my screen, I can see small photos and they are covering a part of my slide. Is that what you also see on your screens? Should I uh, try to hide these thumbnails? No, it's clear. Oh, you don't see the thumbnails. No, I see the, the, I see your presentation. Okay, you see all of my slide. Okay, that's excellent. Now, another question, uh, should we have a break at some point? Yes, uh, Professor Notling, uh, Unfortunately, I forget to tell you that the time is uh, uh, for us is from 11 to 12.40 divided by two. So our time is will be stopped at about, um, now it's 11.40. Now we are going to about 12.15. Is it okay for you or yes. what time do you like to stop? 12.15 sounds like a good time. I will try to, to time that. Yes. Um, I uh, believe I will be able to cover the main parts until that time. Yes, because we, we are going to have discussion and maybe there are some participants who are going to ask about uh, your presentation because your presentation is very interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank yes. you. You can continue. So. Yeah, so let's continue then. What have we actually found at the pitch decks of Airbnb, Uber, Facebook, Tesla, YouTube, Slidebean, and Monthly? Um, are you all familiar with these companies? Well, if not, let me briefly mention what they do. So Airbnb is a company uh, enabling people to host guests in their own apartment. So it's kind of a pair-to-pair -pair hotel 
service. Uh, and they are currently a unicorn. Their latest evaluate, evaluation was 18 billion US dollars. That was, however, before COVID-19. So I'm wondering what they are worth today. Then Uber, uh, that's a, a taxi service uh, where uh, private people can uh, offer taxi services to, to anyone and you can uh, catch a new, an Uber using an app. So what they have done is actually that they have converted uh, physical travel into actually uh, travel of information and thereby managed to make it more in, more, much more efficient. And Uber uh, has uh, done an IPO. Then Facebook, well, that's the large social network, uh, which is uh, used in most countries, but banned in some like China, uh, founded by Mark Zuckerberg and has also IPO'd. Uh, Tesla, uh, so that's a company uh, run by Elon Musk, creating uh, electrical cars, and they have also IPO'd. Then we have YouTube, uh, which is a video sharing platform uh, which is a part of Alphabet, the parent company of Google. Then we have Slidebean, uh, which is a, a company that has uh, automated creation of, uh, of presentations and in particular is used a lot by uh, entrepreneurs to create pitch decks. And then we have Monthly, which is a, a fairly young company uh, offering uh, SaaS ops services, uh, meaning that uh, they provide a platform where you can get an overview of all your SaaS subscriptions. Now, um, worth noting here is that actually only monthly has a go-to-market plan and only Slidebean has a slide describing how to use funds. And only Airbnb had a testimonial slide. And then all the other slides are found at more than one company. Now, these main slides, uh, when it comes to the problem, the solution, uh, the market size, uh, the competition, the team, are found at most of these. Now, I assume that the reason for why actually some of these are missing is because um, it's a bit hard to get uh, pitch decks for companies. And uh, I have here been using pitch decks recreated by slide beans based on information that they have managed to get about the original pitch decks of these companies uh, used at some point during their journey. So let us now move into the intersection. Now to quote Kaya, this is where you present your case, your problem, your premise and your proposed solution. Now the key objective of this part is to capture the investor's attention. Because if you don't capture it here, well, as I said, I have gotten more than 50 pitch decks. Um, I actually, I tried to count them, but I realized it was too many to count them. Uh, that means uh, that for businesses that don't immediately seem very interesting, uh, you are unlikely to get a second chance. So you had better catch the, in, the attention immediately. Now, moving over to the cover slide, um, here you have the cover slide by six of these uh, seven companies that I have chosen to pick slides from. Um, what I think is worth noting is that you have the company logo clearly visible and you have a short description of what the company is doing. So for example, for Uber, next generation car service, for Airbnb, 
book rooms with locals rather than hotels, YouTube, broadcast yourself, slide bean, presentations that design themselves. The Facebook, well, they chose instead to take a quote, which is very descriptive. Cases are, uh, classes are being skipped, work is being ignored. Students are spending hours in front of the computer in utter fascination. The Facebook craze has swept through campus. And Tesla is the exception because they just have a picture taken from a Tesla car, which says it all, doesn't it? Now, to provide you a little bit of background about these uh, six companies and the slide decks that I have included here, um, two of these slide decks are, as far as I know, originals. Uh, the Facebook uh, pitch deck from spring 2004, uh, which was used before uh, Peter Thiel's famous 500,000 dollar in angel investment in the summer of 2004. Um, as far as I know, they actually didn't raise any money based on this pitch deck. Then we have the slide bean pitch deck from 2016, uh, used by them to raise an, to me, unknown amount of funds that year. And then the other ones are recreations done by slide bean. Uh, based on uh, information they have obtained of the original pitch deck. So for Uber, we have the summer and 2008 pitch deck. Uh, for Airbnb, the 2009 pitch deck used to raise half a million in 2009. And for YouTube, uh, the 2015 pitch deck uh, used to raise uh, 3.5 million uh, in 2015. Um, I think this was actually when they became a part of Alphabet, if I remember correctly, or then it was just before that. Um, now, then for Tesla, it's the 2010 pitch deck. Now, let's move over to the problem. Um, when you start a company, there's two approaches you can take. You identify a problem and you set out to solve it, or you have a technology and you send out and you set out to find a problem that it can solve. Now, I myself um, have done both types of ventures. Uh, Lovisa Yibe, my first company, is an example of the first type. And Aukoti Abe is an example of the second type. Um, I would actually, in general, recommend that you start with the problem that you have identified, and then you find a solution, uh, because uh, you are more likely to succeed in that way. Uh, it's uh, often very hard, actually, uh, to find a good problem to solve uh, for a technology. So the market risk is more significant in that case. Now, the problem should be described clearly. So let's look at three examples. So for Airbnb, uh, they say, Price is an important concern for customer booking, travel online. Hotels leave you disconnected from the city and its culture. No easy way exists to book a room with a local or become a host. Uber described cabs in 2008 as most use aging and inefficient technology, radio dispatch using two-way communication. And the most common car is the Ford Crown Victoria, which drives slowly. Hailing is done by hand or phone 
no GPS coordination between client and driver, uh, significant far fare seeking or dead time for the drivers. Then slide bean, how long does it take you to build a slide presentation? Creating professional slide presentations is a time demanding process. PowerPoint alternative tools are equally inefficient with long learning curves and businesses resolved to using on-demand services, which are manual and expensive. Now, the important thing here to quote Kaya is that you need to, this is where you present the status quo and creating empathy with your investors is the critical at this point. Now, moving over to the solution. So to quote Kaya again, the solution is quite obviously you and your company and your product. So here you should mention how you solve the problem that you just described. So slide bean, they described the solution, a unique user interface plus algorithm that automatically redesigns user content cloud-based indexable presentations that can be viewed and edited on any browser, automatic engagement tracking for each slide, ideal for sales pitch date decks. Then uh, Airbnb, they describe it as a web platform where users can rent out their space to host travelers, save money when traveling, make money when hosting, share culture, local connection to the city. Now, to continue on the solution, when you create the solution slide, you should think of benefits instead of features, to quote Kaya, and you should avoid tech jargon because um, using tech jargon is impolite towards the reader that is actually probably not an expert in your field. And here you also have an additional example from monthly and from YouTube that I recommend that you look at yourself. Then uh, not all companies have a product demo, but if you have a product that is demonstrable, um, I think it is a promotion where a product is demonstrated to potential customers, to quote Kaya. Um, depending on your product, you can either demonstrate it by some pictures of people using it as Uber have done, or also add views from the app or maybe a small video of how the app actually is being used. Now, uh, an example, uh, another example is, is photos taken from inside the Tesla car describing its features. And then slide bean, they actually have a video demonstrating their service and if you make um, a video, then uh, remember that your video demo should reach an aha moment in 30 seconds or less. Because again, most investors, they view a lot of pitch decks. So the time they can afford to spend is short. So you need to make them feel that, ah, I get it. And uh, to make a, a demo, a video demo is in particular useful if you send a pitch deck by email. I have had several companies send me um, links to YouTube videos of their product and that has been very helpful. Now, moving over to the why we will make you rich section. If you manage to catch to make them rich 
that's the whole purpose of this section. Now, I would like to ask, uh, how much time do I still have left? Yes, hang on. Uh, about 15, 15 minutes. 15 minutes, minutes. Yes. okay. Thank you. No worries. So, market size. Uh, this is where you look at how large can this company become. Um, so, the main purpose actually of this slide is to describe how large is the market today, how is it predicted to grow, because this kind of sets an upper limit on how large your company can become. Um, some um, startups, they want to then describe the, how large a market share they think they can get uh, by, for example, taking 1% of the total market or something like that. Um, I actually would advise, advise against that because it's a meaningless exercise to estimate uh, your market size in that way. Um, now, some investors, they don't even want this market size slide uh, because they themselves uh, will estimate it. Um, I, however, uh, would recommend that you in general include it um, because not all investors uh, know the market that you are within. And then this is a, a good way to catch, uh, again, the attention of investors uh, by having a, a market size that is so large that... Uh, people know that this can become a really significant venture because ultimately the market size uh, determines how large the company can become and how much money investor can make through the company. Um, now, uh, let's take a look at three, um, oh, sorry, uh, three of these slides. Um, if we look at Airbnb, then they list that more than 2 billion trips are booked worldwide. And uh, 560 million budget and um, is the budget and online serviceable market. And 84 million trips uh, with Airbnb had been made and their share of the market, they estimated to be 15% of the available market at that time. Then uh, when it comes to the market size uh, for slide bean, then they estimate that graphical design services is 11 billion in the US and 56 billion worldwide. And then they list the growth rate year on year over the last five years. And actually the US market has been shrinking while the global one has been growing by 2% according to the data that they have from IBS world. Now on this slide, uh, I would recommend that you also as a footnote put the source or how you estimated these numbers because that tells a lot about um, how reliable they are. Now over to the business model. So this is where you should tell how the company will make a profit. And looking at Airbnb, well, their business model is simple. They take 10% commission on each transaction. Uh, that means that they at that moment had been earning $84 million and getting an average fee of $25. Um, and if we look at monthly, they charge a monthly description service charge, which is between 49 and 99 US dollars, depending on um, if you have a professional package or a standard subscription. And they also provide 
a free version that is intended to get users started with the service. And then they also have sponsored or affiliate content. Then Slidebean, uh, their business model is based on a monthly subscription service uh, positioned initially at small businesses. So two to 10 employees and they charge then $29 per month. And then they have some additional on demand services available, including a service uh, where one of their professionals uh, make the pitch deck. Now over to competition. So if you have a product that stands far apart from your competitors, then this might be the best way to make sure everyone understands the premise, according to Kaya. Um, if you can illustrate this uh, in, for, in some type of a map where you pick the main characteristics where you stand out, like for example, here for Air and Airbnb, they have chosen price and then uh, uh, how the transaction is done as their metric. And there they are both affordable and the, the transaction is done online, which makes it convenient. And this is compared to, well, all the competitors, which are hotels and, and different booking agencies for hotels in particular. Then if we look at Slidebean, they have chosen as their metrics uh, the quality of the design and how time consuming it is to create the slides. And this is where they stand out. They end up in the upper right quadrant with great design and it's generated automatically and fast. While then the alternatives, uh, Adobe Illustrator, for example, has great design, but it's very manual and time demanding and they consider PowerPoint to be a bad design and very manual and time demanding. Then uh, I think we should move on. So then the underlying magic, this is where you elaborate on the technologies and patents you have developed to make your product or service unique, to quote Kaya again. So if we take uh, two companies that are very different, so slide beans, they have proprietary technology. Um, they have fully indexable slide content, which is what enables them to then do uh, the automatic optimization using uh, genetic algorithms, trying thousands of designs in a very short time unit. And then they have an HTML5 renderer on the client side, which is then unique software that they have. And then they also have integration with some other services, which they consider to be a competitive advantage. Then Airbnb, they list first to market, ease of use, uh, profiles of the hosts, uh, where one can list reviews, which builds trust and the ability to list once and then be available all the time. And then their design and brand and then the initiatives they provide to hosts to make money over one of their free competitors, Coach Surfing. Then Uber, on the other hand, they have listed their technology, the mobile phones with the intelligent scheduling algorithm that they have running in the background, and then their payment utilization and reputation tracking of both drivers and customers. And then they have patent pending system designs. Now Uber today actually have a lot of patents on a lot of different uh, systems and IDs related even to autonomous self-driving uh, cars. 
Then the go to market plan. So the go to market slide should refer to your plans to acquire a mass audience. And the point of this slide is providing that you can figure out ways to grow your business, both with a large pool of ideas and the ability to execute. Now, uh, depending on at what stage your business is, this will of course uh, look different. If you are in a very early stage, then this will com be completely hypothetical. Um, and in such a case, I would strongly recommend you to identify a beachhead vertical, which is a small, small part of the market that you think you will address in the future uh, that you can address already today, either thanks to some connections that you have within that market uh, or thanks to it being local where you are located or thanks to the technology that you have. It sh the beachhead should be a market where you have ideally an 10x advantage over all the competitors and where you can quickly become the dominant player. It doesn't need to be big enough to make your company profitable, but it needs to be a place where you can start, become dominant, and then from there, grow into other market segments. So um, if we look then at, for example, monthly, uh, they provide some, uh, go, uh, some uh, monthly stats uh, for slide B. Organic web visits, a customer acquisition cost of $60 and um, half a million organic video views. And then they say that Slidebean is uniquely positioned to market and promote this product as part of a suite of startup solutions. So it's an analysis that they did of Slidebean. And then they continue to say that uh, um, Slidebean, uh, no, sorry that they have a, a unique advantage to position this product by leveraging our existing user base of half a million leads and 35,000 monthly signups. Um, on the go-to-market plan, uh, we, don't, we do not say we are doing direct sales or we will do online sales because that's not a go-to-market strategy. Uh, those are sales tactics. So uh, let's take a look at Uber. So they list some marketing ID, different uh, short teasers they could have. The one-click cab, the net jets of limos, cabs 2.0, possible slogans used for marketing, and then that uh, their aim is to become the ubiquitous premium cab service and that they are planning to grow through an invite only referred from an existing member manner. Then over to the team slide. Well, to quote Kaya, this slide should be simple mention your founders and why are you the right people to grow this company. Do not talk about your advisors, first employees, or anyone who is not dedicated 100% to the company. So to take an example from YouTube, you have the three co-founders, Steve Chen, Chad Hurley, and Javred Karim and under each of them listing some of their experiences and qualities that makes them together a winning team that can implement uh, the business successfully. Now over to the last part, the wrap up, 
and I would again like to ask how much time do I have? And the point of this part is to list the price of the stake in the winning horse that you are offering to the investor. So how much time do I have still? Uh, five minutes left, thank you. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> so traction milestones. Now, first, a piece of advice uh, regarding this traction slide. If you are pitching in front of an audience in a demo day type of event, this slide should probably go first, right up after your cover. Uh, this gives you credibility early on and captures people's attention for the rest of the pitch. I agree with Kaya on these points. Now, if you are not pitching and you are sending your pitch deck by email, then it should instead be one of the last slides because you want to leave the investor with a feeling that you are capable, you are making great progress, and you are growing rapidly. And on this slide, you can, for example, list some events that show traction progress to date, or uh, you can, uh, for example, list a progress on a key metric for your business. Uh, it could be revenue, like here for slide bean, um, or it could be monthly growth uh, combined with both net revenue and subscriptions in terms of monthly recurring revenue. Then finally, the fundraising information. Now, first, a warning. In the US, the SEC has certain regulations as to whom can you show your financial data. So you should be careful when sending your deck to people who are, aren't accredited investors. Um, meaning that if you pitch on stage, you should probably not include this slide. But if you send it to an investor over email, then you are probably fine including it. And you should include it because you will get these questions if the investor is interested. And what you include here is simply the amount of fund you are looking for and the stake in the company you are selling for that. So if we, for example, look at the RMB slide here, so they are looking for 12 months financing to reach 80,000 transactions on air, bed, and breakfast. Uh, they just want to raise half a million in an angel round. And they count to be able to reach 2 million in revenue over the 12 months by using this money. Now, they didn't list how large a stake in the company the investors will get here. Ultimately, that's, of course, a discussion between you and the investor. Uh, but I think it's uh, good to provide what you would like to see it to be. But that, of course, requires uh, that you are able to come with a reasonable estimate based on other similar transactions. Also add a slide on how you are going to use the funds in some cases, if you want. Um, for example, it's a big difference if you are going to use it all on marketing to grow the market, or if you are going to use it to develop technology that um, determines the risk for the investor very largely. In the former case, it's market risk. Are you able to grow? And team risk probably that dominates. And in the later case, it's technical risk plus market risk plus team risk plus probably some other risks also, like, for example, infringing on other companies' technology and regulatory risk. Now, having completed this uh, walkthrough, 
of what you should include uh, in a pitch deck using examples from uh, famous companies. Uh, I would once again like to recommend you to see the startup pitch video by Kaya. And you have a link here to it. Now, uh, I would also like to mention that Slidebean, they have raised uh, 850,000 in their seed round. Now, finally, I would like to thank you for listening and all these inspiring companies uh, who have made the pitch decks uh, that I have taken slides from here, uh, in particular Slidebean and Kaya who have done most of the work. Now, your task uh, is to, within the next two weeks, make a pitch deck uh, because um, during the lecture, two weeks from now, you will actually be pitching and uh, everyone in the audience will get to vote by investing money into the companies that are pitching. And I will be providing feedback on the pitches that you are making and on your decks, how you can improve them. Now, I believe that uh, feedback is absolutely essential when it comes to making a good pitch deck, not to mention creating a successful company. So I would advise all of you, ensure that you get some mentors advisors early on that have experience and that can help you. That will save you a lot of time and significantly increase your probability of being successful. And this is why I hope to provide a starter to you in terms of providing then feedback on your pitch deck uh, two weeks from now. Now, for all the companies that have sent me their pitch deck, I have answered them with some questions and recommendations on their pitch deck, if it has been within a business that I know something about. Um, I have also had some companies send me pitch decks for businesses that I really don't know anything about. And then I have answered, sorry, I don't know anything about this business, which means I can't invest in it, nor can I advise you. So when it comes to finding uh, investors, pick target investors that are within the domain that your business is in, because a guiding principle for all investors is to only invest in companies they understand. Now, when it comes to uh, the topic of what tech investors want to see in a pitch deck and the criteria that the company should fulfill in order for me to invest, that's a topic I will be addressing next week. And uh, my hope is that you by then would have a basic pitch deck that you have put together already based on these examples. And then you can use the information I provide you next week to improve upon and refine it, to target it towards what tech investors like me would like to see. So a lot more advice on how to actually convince an investor to invest comes next week. And now with this, I would like to end my presentation and open up the floor for questions. Yes, thank you very much for presentations, Dr. Notling. Um, yes, and now I think uh, the remaining time is 20 minutes from now. Uh, please, the audience, if you have any questions or make some discussion or advice about the presentations, please, thank you. Take your time. Anybody want to ask?
So while we are waiting for the first question, I would like to point out to everyone that my slides have been shared um, by Irfan in the chat. You can find the link to Google Drive where you can download my slides that I presented today. And uh, since the chat will be disappearing when we close this session, I recommend you click on the link now and download them now, or that you at least save the link. Now, I see that there's also a link uh, for uh, providing questions. Um, and feedback. And providing feedback. So I would also recommend you to then uh, fill in the questions and to provide the feedback uh, so that uh, you can help both uh, ITS and me uh, to improve this presentation and uh, this kind of events for the future. Now, uh, you are most welcome to write your question in the chat. Uh, during uh, previous online lectures that I have been giving, I have actually found that it's easier for people uh, to ask their question in the chat. Now, um, I have also found actually that if I turn off recording, then people are much more willing to ask questions. So may I ask uh, the organizers, uh, is this session still being recorded? Yes, yes, of course, yes, we still. can record it, the session, Prof. Um, do you think it would be a good idea perhaps to turn off the recording now so that uh, that wouldn't be an obstacle to people asking questions? Okay. Uh, I can see uh, from the link that we already have uh, several questions. Maybe you I haven't put invite... any link, uh, Dr. Nordling. You haven't put any link where everybody can have your presentations. Uh, yes, so my presentation is available from the Google Drive link that uh -huh. um, uh, Irfan has kindly posted in the chat for this session. Uh, and uh, I have also emailed um, that link to, to all the organizers. So maybe the, uh, the course uh, coordinator could uh, post it somewhere else so that everyone can access it. Now, when it comes to the question form, uh, I'm not able to actually uh, see the questions that are being submitted. Uh, sorry, uh, Nordin, for interrupting. Uh, Miss Desi, can you provide the form to both uh, Professor Nordin and also Professor Eko? Uh, I think we have the link. Yes, yes. To okay. see the questions so, that has been asked. Uh, okay. Can I... There has been some questions. Or yeah. maybe one of you could uh, act as moderator and read up the question. Yeah. And then I can try to answer it. Yes. Uh, uh, Read my questions. I can I send you directly without any writing. <laughs> Sometimes writing is much takes time, you know. Yes. Of yeah. Course. Okay. Well. Uh, yes. My question is so: uh, How you estimate the numbers of in each your presentations? Uh, there are any numbers from the company. So, how did you get the numbers? So, that seems to be beautiful. The numbers. Uh, and every PowerPoint, yeah. But how do you estimate the number? Thank you. Okay, so um, are you referring to these numbers that I have on the slides taken from the pitch decks of these companies? Or are you referring to the numbers that I uh, uh, provided regarding what's available in different pitch decks? So uh, yes, um, in, the, in the former case, um, none of these numbers are by me. These are the numbers estimated by the company who created the pitch deck. 
Uh, the the numbers uh, situated in the last, uh, a little bit at the end of your presentation. Close to the conclusion. So you mean these numbers? Yeah, yes. Hmm? Yes, fundraising information. Okay, so uh, when it comes to um, fundraising, um, I would actually recommend that you first try to estimate how much money will you need to raise before you can do an exit? How much money will be needed, in other words, for your company to become a global success? Um, then um, that amount of money you should target raising while giving away approximately half of the company. Now, typically you raise the money in several rounds and you start small and then gradually the amount that you get in each round is growing. Typically the growth of the company is exponential. It's exponential in terms of number of customers, uh, revenue, and therefore also value, and therefore money that is raised in each sequential round. So uh, starting then in the early stage, so typically the first pre-seed angel investment round, that's somewhere up to 100,000 US dollars. Um, and it's typically um, several angels investing at different time points. It typically starts with friends and family investing. Uh, and uh, therefore the number is probably slightly growing. Then um, the first real round uh, is typically the seed round. And in the seed round, uh, you commonly raise somewhere between half a million to a million. Now, uh, in order to then, when you are exiting, reach this stage of having sold around half the company, uh, meaning that investors own approximately half of the company and the founders plus all staff and other people who have gotten options own approximately the other half. This means that you can't sell too large a portion of the company in the beginning. So normally during the, these rounds, you sell somewhere between 10 to 20% of the company in each round. Um, yeah. So um, that's how you reach the numbers. Now, that also means that in the beginning, so the first time you actually get an evaluation of your company is the seed round. Um, normally, that's kind of a, you know, a standard evaluation or valuation for the industry. So it's not really a valuation of your company. It's normally based on a rule of thumb, like, okay, a company that is in the SaaS business normally do their seed round at this value. Um, often it's around somewhere between uh, 5 million to 10 million. Now, then when you come series A, that's normally where you really get the first valuation where a VC has been doing a proper due diligence of your company and can set a price on it. Now, due to this problem with how to value a startup, it's common that the early investments from angels uh, during the pre-seed and the seed round are on convertible notes, uh, meaning that uh, uh, you specify 
that the value of the company will be fixed at the later qualified funding event. And then you specify what kind of discount relative to what the investor, the lead investor in that round sets as the price for the shares and a cap, which is a, a cap on the value at which uh, the convertible will convert. Now, the discount and the cap are very crucial for early investors because coming in early, they take a much larger risk. So it would not be reasonable that their typically also smaller money would convert at the same valuation as a later investor. Now, um, typical discounts uh, in pre-seed cases are between 20 and 50%. And uh, typical caps are between 1 million and 5 million. Now, for the founders to not end up selling their whole company, it's uh, sometimes also common to have a floor which specifies a minimum value for the company when it's being converted into shares. That's in case of, uh, you know, the growth of the company is not as expected and, uh, and the company has to raise money at a much lower valuation at a later time point. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, in order to ensure that these convertibles actually convert, uh, there's typically also a, a deadline for when it must convert. And this deadline can vary from between half a year up to three years. And that means that this qualifying financing round that actually sets the value of the company needs to happen within this time uh, otherwise, either the convertible will convert automatically uh, on agreed terms. Typically, it will then be at the cap, the value cap, uh, or then uh, it needs to be renegotiated. Then, uh, depending on the type of agreement used, uh, uh, there could also be uh, an interest rate and the money is actually given as a loan and then conditions for priority to get the money back in case of liquidation, uh, or then it's specified that this is an advanced subscription. And uh, several um, accelerators, they actually provide good templates. Some of the most common being the safe template, um, the And, um, yeah, so you can check out, for example, 500 startups and Y Combinator, uh, then you can find templates for this. Yes. Thank you, Prof. Dartling. Uh, I think there are still another person who want to ask. Please, if there is another question from lecturer or student, please take your time. Okay, hello. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, I see the, the from the participant list, there is a Kansa. Hello, Kansa, you can ask directly to Prof. Nording. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor and Pa Eko. Uh, I would like to ask, in your previous slide, you talk about uh, go to market plan. Professor, what is the difference between the sales strategy and the go to market plan? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, the go-to-market plan is actually describing your journey towards the mass market. So, you start with a vertical, uh, a beachhead vertical, where you then should aim to getting a majority, become the dom dominating player, and then how you grow this market. Uh, while a sales strategy, uh, well, that uh, uh, has more to do with um, the value proposition and how you are going to sell your product. Um, so um, the go-to-market strategy is focused really on 
what markets do you address and in which order and how can you uh, take market shares in them while the sales strategy is okay so what is your sales pitch uh, your unique value proposition that is going to convert customers and how um, are you then going to reach these customers so typically one distinguished between for example, uh, enterprise sales, uh, where you have a dedicated sale person that then calls the company, uh, goes and meets the company, presents the product and so forth, versus, for example, doing advertising online, for example, in on Facebook or Google search, and then getting people to click on the ad, go to your web page and there get them to buy the product. As you can understand, these two uh, sales channels have very different costs and very different requirements attached with them. So I can see that we have a hand raised by Alia Yes. So um, you maybe ask a question. Okay. I was um, wondering about the market size. There's a slide about market size, right? Mm -hmm. And in that slide, we are expected to uh, pre present the predicted growth of our company and product. So, yeah, yeah. So I had an assignment on where I'm supposed to predict the growth of my ideas for my company but I have trouble in making this market size uh, slide. I have trouble in finding a reliable source. Do you have any like recommendation on how we're supposed to do it? So uh, first we'll I would like to point out that uh, the market size is not actually about your company. Um, on the um, market uh, size slide, you should describe the size of the market that your company is targeting, not mm -hmm. the part of that market that you think your company will achieve. Because um, let's say that you, for example, like Uber, you target the taxi market. Well, the taxi market globally, it's huge. There's what kind of share of that market you will get when you are just about to let's say, launch your first uh, taxi service, mm -hmm. it's impossible for you to estimate that. So these estimates, um, they used to be in the past recommended that people should make them. And often what people did is that they first found some Gardner report, for example, of the size of uh, the taxi market and how it's estimated to grow over the next 10 years. And then they picked 1% of that, which is silly. I mean, it doesn't add any value uh -huh. uh, to the reader. So, so I would really recommend, don't estimate the market size your company is gonna get. Instead, estimate the size of the market that your company is addressing and this you can typically find Gardner or some other consultancy organization focused on, you know, analyzing different industries and markets. They typically provide reports with estimates of the size of different markets. So the best starting point is to Google. Now, um, once you have gotten this kind of a market size for the overall market that you target in the long run. What I love to see is that you actually then do the same thing for the beachhead vertical where you start and some intermediate market that you think you can address in between. So sort of that you estimate the market size for the steps you are taking along your go-to-market journey. Did this answer your question? 
Yes, thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Any other question, please? Or if not, I think Pak Asriya, I think the time is up because now it's 12.40, I suppose. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah, that, that is correct. Uh, we, we can uh, try to end the session uh, now. We, we do have some questions, but because of the limited time, maybe we can cover those questions uh, in, in the next session, which is next week, hopefully, <laughs> and, uh, or, or maybe in another time. If, if, if it's possible. Okay, I'll give it back to uh, Pa Eko. Pa Eko, you, you can close the, the session if, if, if you're ready. All right. So thank you all and see you next week. Yes, I'm, I'm going to close a little bit, Prof Nordling. Yes. Yes, one okay. in one or two minutes, I'm going to close this opportunity. Well, ladies and gentlemen, lecturers and students, I think today we have a good, interesting lectures from Professor Nodlings, and about uh, about how to the strategy to put the product into the market. For Prof Nodling, thank you very much for your time, for your contributions. You are great here. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think uh, uh, now it time is for Pastrian. Please, thank you. Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Ekon Rimianto for the closing, and actually. From the committee, but Jesse, there, there's still one one more thing before we stop the event. I'll give it back to Miss. Oh, Angie, sorry, not Jesse. Angie. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Professor Nordling, for the excellent lecture today, and thank you for Professor Echo for conducting this amazing session. Uh, furthermore, we would like to present a certificate awarding to Professor Nodling as our speaker today and also for Professor Echo as our moderator today. Okay, the first is certificate of appreciation to Professor Nodling as our speaker. Thank you very much. It's my honor. Thank you, Professor. And the next is certificate of appreciation for Professor Echo as our moderator today. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, before we end our lecture today, we invite you all participants as well as the honorable of speaker and moderator to take a group photo. So for the participants, please open your camera. Okay, for all participants, please open your camera. We would like to take a group photo. Um, there are 14 pages. I will start with the page one. Uh, committee ready, but they see. Okay, of course, for page one, I will count in one, two, and three, smile. Okay, next. In patch two, I will count in one, two, and three. Smile. Okay, next page. I will count in one, two, and three. Smile. Okay, the fourth page. I will count in one. Two and three, smile. Okay, the next page, I'll count in one, two and three, smile. Okay, next page, in one, two and three, smile. Okay, next page, there are a lot of pages. <laughs> okay, next, <laughs> I will count in one, two, and three, smile. Okay, next page, in one, two, and three, smile. Okay, next again, 
And one, two, and three. Smile. Okay, I'm ready to see you. Oh, more. what pages now? Done already. Okay, next page. In one, two, and three. Smile. Okay, already all the pages, Angie. Okay, thank you, Madesi. Okay, we've taken a group photo. Then for the participants, please fill the feedback form through the link bit.ly flash GLP underscore feedback that you can also in the Zoom chat room too. Finally, we have reached the end of today's GLP and we sincerely apologize for any mistakes we may have made in presenting as a Master of Ceremony and Committee. Thank you for Professor Nobling and Professor Echo and all participants to attendance this program. And we will see you in the next GLP. Good afternoon and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam. Okay, thank, thank you very much to okay. everyone. Thank you, Professor. Terima kasih. Thank you. Ah, sama-sama. Terima kasih. Uh, yeah. Ibu Gita. <laughs> Ibu Gita Witi. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, Professor Nodling, are you still here? So next week, the, I would like to introduce for next week, the moderator is Ibu Gita. So she's here. Yeah. Um, if you, we, we can talk uh, some for some preparations later on, maybe. Okay. Uh, um, sounds good. I, uh, yeah, I have to email. go now. Sometimes, I'm sorry, sometimes your email went to the, the quarantine thing. Uh, yeah, I'm but, trying yeah. to fix that. Sorry. Okay. Talk <laughs> to right. you later. Bye. Bye. See you, everyone. Okay. See you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Terima kasih, Pak.